tonight uh, we are continuing in our series in 1 John, and we come in 1 John to chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and we'll be looking together at verses 7 through 11. 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. So if you turn with me in your Bible there, or in the Pew Bible, that would be in the rack in front of you. 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. Hear now God's Word. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So far the reading from God's word. May he add his blessing to us this evening. Well, there's something really exciting about moving from something that is old to something that is new. I remember uh, in my own childhood, I went to a school uh, we learned to write with a fountain pen. And you could just see your little ink insert getting closer and closer to the end. And you couldn't wait. You'd start writing extra lines so that that ink would go out so that you could go up and get that new little ink refill uh, from your teacher's uh, desk. It's, it's an exciting time. Now, some of us don't have, uh, have fountain pens that we can get their ink refills anymore. But sometimes it can be something as simple as as rearranging the furniture in your house, or, or for those of us who, who move around quite a bit, coming to that new house and, and finding that new neighborhood and, and the new friends and, and the new bedrooms and, and all those things. Uh, there is an excitement that comes along with the new. And so here too in the, in the letter of John, the first letter of John, uh, he's speaking of something that is new, which is an improvement over that which is old. Uh, that is... His, uh, his, his goal is to, to reaffirm in us uh, the greater promises that we have in the new. And, and so he applies it to redemptive history, the fact that Christ came and redeemed for himself a people. And so we want to take a look through that together in 1 John chapter 2. We want to look first of all at, at what is old. Uh, he talks about the commandment which is old. Uh, what is that? What is that commandment? We're going to look at that in verse 7. We're going to look also at what it means to have something be new in the commandments of God. That's in, in chapter 2, verse 8. And then we're going to look at what is common in verses 9 through 11. There is something that is old in verse 7, something that is new in verse 8, and something that is common in verses 9 through 11. So let's give our attention now to the text. In verse 7 we start and, and John introduces uh, the topic with warm language again. He calls his audience his beloved. He's writing to his children in the faith. And as he's writing to these children in the faith, he is seeking to give them a little bit of clarification. Uh, what they are hearing uh, may sound new to them. But what John says to them is what sounds new is actually not new at all. It is simply a restatement of an old commandment which has been, it says in verse 7, uh, from the beginning. Now we have to figure out what it means that these things are from the beginning. The beginning of what? How do we know what the beginning is? There are several possibilities. It could be the beginning of the New Testament church. It could be the beginning of the church when the apostles formed that first congregation in Jerusalem. And from that time on, there was a commandment and they've known it because this is some time after the foundation of that first congregation in Jerusalem. Another possibility is that this was a commandment that they received at birth. That from birth, everybody receives this commandment and knows it in intuitively and so they know this commandment that it is one which they have had from the beginning the beginning of their lives but uh, it's rather greater than that isn't it it is uh, instead something that goes far beyond our own birth it goes far beyond the birth of the new testament church and we can get some clarification on on what it means from the gospel of john and we see that often as we work our way through the letter of john that the terms that are being used in this letter can be clarified for us in the gospel. So I want us to look at John chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with 
God. This term, in the beginning, used by John at the beginning of his gospel, as well as in the letter that we are reading together. Now, what was taking place in the beginning when the Word was with God? It says in verse 3, All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So what is the beginning? The beginning is the foundation of the world. It is the creation of the world. And John is saying to his readers, from the beginning, from the creation of this world, this commandment has been in place. The commandment goes back to the foundation of the world when God hung the earth in its place and the moon around it made all the animals, all the birds, all, all things that we see and all things that we don't see. We all have this command and none is in the world without this command. It has been from the beginning. Now, we just have to figure out what the commandment exactly was because uh, we are jumping into a, a verse and it is always informed uh, by the context. It is an old commandment that we had from the beginning. And the commandment, it says in verse 7, is the word that you have heard. It is the word that John has been talking about to his people in this letter so far. So that brings us back to chapter 1, from chapter 1, verse 5, through to chapter 2, Verse 6, that's the summary uh, of what John has been talking about today. This commandment that you have heard. It's the message which has been proclaimed to them. It is the message that John has proclaimed to the people who are receiving his letter. And what is that message? Well, the, the message is, uh, of, has several components to it. One is that, that God is light and that, uh, that it, it, there is no darkness uh, in him. Uh, one is that we are sinful but that there is forgiveness for those who turn to the Lord in forgiveness. We have seen these things to be true from chapter two uh, and verse, or from chapter one, verse five, through to chapter two, verse six. And it speaks of God being light in that place. And so, as we review what it means that God is light, we see several things. We see that God made light. It's the first act that he that he committed in creation. He made the light. So he began the establishment of order in the world with the creation of light. It speaks that uh, of the, the light that we have from His Word. In Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a, a light to my path. Uh, the Word of God acts as a light to us though, so that we would know, so that we would not stumble. We know that God is our light then and that if we walk in His ways, if we live uh, according to His Word, we will have Life. Now, this is not uh, something that is speaking of uh, works righteousness per se, but it is speaking of the obligations that we have to God. So, in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 16, the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge and go of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. What's the implication? If you obey the commandments of God, if Adam and Eve obeyed the commandments of God in the garden, they would have life. They would have life. The same thing is repeated for us by uh, Christ himself in Luke chapter 10 and verse 28 when that, <coughs> that lawyer is seeking to gain his own salvation and having the rabbi Jesus tell his tickling ears what he wants to hear. He's saying, how can I justify uh, myself and Jesus points him to the law and asks him uh, what the law is and he tells him that he shall love the Lord your God with all your heart soul strength and with all your mind and what does Christ say to him you have answered correctly do this and you will live so there is uh, light with God there is life with God as we walk according to his commandments now, the shape that's specifically in question here in the book of 1 John can be given to us as we look at verse 10 of our passage. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. So we're speaking specifically of our relationship with our fellow man. We're speaking specifically of how we interact with man and man. In addition to that, the commandment that he has given to them also speaks of the forgiveness. It's not speaking of the perfection of man, but it is assuming our fall, it is assume, assuming our sin, and commanding us to seek forgiveness in Christ. Now, there are several points of theology that we can learn from a passage like this. When it speaks of an old commandment which was from the beginning, and when he gives that instruction to a New Testament church, we can learn something. 
And we can see that there is a continuity between Old Testament and New Testament. And the reason we bring that out is because it is so common in our day to make a distinction between the two, isn't there? And we make a distinction. Well, that was Old Testament, but we're in the New Testament, so everything is different for us. But what John is saying is that's not the case. There is a commandment which has existed uh, from the foundation of the heavens and the earth. And it has been the same all the way through up until the time of the New Testament church. The, the old and the new, they are, they are not different. They are, uh, they are not distinct. They have significant overlap. And so we understand that to be true of the Old and the New Testament. The second thing that we can learn about this from a term in terms of of, uh, of theology deals with our justification because when we uh, justification meaning how we are declared righteous before God that's what we're talking about in justification and and the reason we can make decision or learn something about justification in this passage is because it speaks to us of our need for forgiveness uh, the commandment that John has given to his people deals with with the need for forgiveness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is part of the commandment that John gives to the church. And so we know if the commandment was from the beginning, we understand that the, the commandment which included the need for forgiveness, uh, a need for acknowledgement of sin from the foundations of the world that existed. The covenant of grace, the, the fact that God sends a Savior into the world to stand in our place, begins not with Christ. It begins with the fall. The covenant of grace begins with the fall because it is at the fall that we became unable to, to live in obedience to God's commandments uh, without sin. And so we stand and, and take a look back at justification and we see uh, that God has treated His people the same way from the foundation of the world. It is sin that makes us corrupt, and so now we are all in need of a mediator. That was true for Israel. It is true for you and for me. But then we also see that the promise comes with some, some reassurances. Uh, the fact that we have a mediator, uh, that, that is also given from the beginning. We saw in, in chapter 2. That if we do sin, we saw that that word if was also possible to be translated when. So when anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ is part of the commandment, which was from the beginning. There has been a mediator for God's people from the beginning. Now how do we know that? We can see it in several different places. We can see it in the sacrificial system that God gave to the people of Israel. A constant reminder that they were in need of forgiveness. Why, why is this a constant reminder? How often did they offer these sacrifices? In some cases, it was daily. In some cases, it was annually. But there was a constant repetition of the sacrifices, the blood of bulls and of sheep to atone for the sin of the people of God. The sacrifices and the priests stood between the people and between God. Now, we see that uh, most clearly laid out for us immediately after the Ten Commandments is given. Uh, God gives the Ten Commandments at Sinai, and in uh, chapter 20, verse 19, almost the next verse after the law is given, the people of Israel respond to what they have seen on the mountain. And what did the people of God ask of Moses? Verse 19, they say to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. There was a mediator between the people of God and God. There was someone who stood in between. In the Old Testament, it was an anticipation. Uh, there's no clarity of the who or the where of this final Messiah, the, the final one who would stand between us and God. Uh, there was simply an anticipation of that truth. And so uh, the Old Testament and, and the New Testament are continuous. It's a continuity of the same. This is, uh, how, many, how many books is this? It's 66 books. But how many books is it really? It's one book. It's one book. It's not 39 in the old and 27 in the new. It's one book. And we understand that from what, what instruction John gives us here in chapter 2 and verse 7. This is an old commandment 
but it's, and it's a commandment that we have had from the beginning. So what's new then? If it's all continuous, why is John writing about a new commandment? What is new about it? So we come to verse 8. Verse 8 says, At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. So although the commandment in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is the same, there is still something that is different, John says to us. Uh, the diff is the difference uh, that it is uh, true in him and in you? That's one possibility. Or <clears throat> is the difference that the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining? If you look down at verse 8, we can, we can make sense of it. Uh, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you. And then let's take out that little part that's in between the commas, which is true in him and in you. So we would read it, at the same time it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Why is there something that is new? Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Uh, what that means then for us uh, is not that in the Old Testament... Uh, people earned their salvation by obedience, and in the New Testament now, it is by faith. Because we can look in the Old Testament and, and see places where the call to righteousness in the heart is the same as it is in the New Testament. So look in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Uh, the Shema, which is such a well-known passage of Scripture, uh, right following the second giving of the law. And God says to His people through Moses, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength. Does that sound different than what is required of you and of me? No. We are to love God, not externally. We're not to love God in the obedience to His commandments exclusively. We are to love God from the inner parts of our being. We are to love God from our hearts. And that's what God commanded to the people in, Deuteron in Deuteronomy, the people of Israel, it's the same commandment that he gives to us. In that same passage, when, when the lawyer is questioning Christ of how he is to be justified, he answers correctly in verse 27 of Luke 10. You shall love the Lord your God. He repeats what we read in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. And what does Christ say to him? Christ says to him, you have answered correctly. What is given as the right motivation in the Old Testament is also given as the right motivation attitude in the new but there is a difference and that difference is that the darkness is passing away that the true light is already shining so who is this true light it's a personification well we know from chapter 1 of 1st John and verse 5 that God is light so we understand that to be true but again we can go to the gospel of John and in the gospel of John uh, we see that definition expanded for, for us a little bit. In the Gospel of John, speaking of the Word, it's speaking about who, kids? When it speaks of the Word in the book of John, who is he talking about? He's speaking about Jesus, right? Jesus was the Word. And so it's speaking about the Word of God in the beginning of the Gospel of John. And in verse 4 it says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So Jesus then is the light. The light, Jesus, is shining in the darkness. And so when John in his letter says that the true light is already shining, he is speaking of Christ. He is speaking of Christ coming, establishing the kingdom of God with his resurrection. So what's different? What's new? Christ has come. That is what is different. That is what is new. The one to whom Old Testament saints only looked in anticipation without clarity, now has arrived and we have seen His coming. It, it speaks in the New Testament of the mystery that has been hidden for ages and generations is now disclosed to the saints. That's the difference. That is what is new. The darkness is fading and the light has already begun, begun to shine. And so the effect on the commandment is that the revelation of God's promise is better. It's richer. It's brighter. All those things ought to work in us a change. Our love for God, likewise then, should be uh, richer and brighter. The externals of the law are the same. 
but the internal motivation behind our obedience to the law is what should have changed, what should have changed, because the darkness is passing away, the new light is, the true light is already shining. The kingdom of Christ is here then. Uh, there is still sin, there is still darkness, but the end of the darkness is uh, palpable, it's touchable, it is discernible. Uh, the end of, uh, of the darkness was only a promise or only an idea in the Old Testament. But for those of us who live uh, in the New Testament administration of the covenant of grace, for us it's a reality. The Messiah has come. He has walked the earth. He has cried out on the cross. It is finished. And so we have that greater hope. We have that greater joy. Something that is better for us in the New Testament age than it, is, than it was for our Old Testament brothers and sisters. But what we do see in the passage also is that, that John is not saying the, lightness has, the, the, the true light has come and so now everything is light. He is saying uh, that the darkness is passing away. It hasn't passed away completely yet, but it is passing away. And so as it is passing away, uh, we are reminded of the presence of sin in our very own lives. It is uh, easy to revert to the darkness, isn't it? The darkness being uh, trusting in our own ways, the, the commandments of men. That would be the darkness because in the commandments of men, there is no true understanding of how we are to have life and to have it in the full. That only comes through Christ. So, when we trust in our methods rather than in our Savior, now that is when we revert to the darkness. And the Pharisees were charged with that kind of behavior by the Savior. In, in Matthew chapter 15, uh, Christ speaks of these things when He speaks of the Pharisees. In that, uh, th that passage, He says the following, This people honors Me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. It is in the commandments of men that we have darkness. In man there is darkness because of sin. In Christ there is light because of his righteousness. And so that has several applications for us as God's people. First of all, it ought to work in us an exercise of private, and, uh, private worship and prayer. An acknowledgement that the light is here. The the opposite is a neglect of prayer, isn't it? If we trust in the works of man, what need would we have for prayer to the God who saved us? If we think we have it all together, would we turn to prayer? When does the non-believer turn to God in prayer? When he's in desperate need. That's when he turns to God in prayer. Uh, when we see the light, when we have fellowship with the light, when we acknowledge that the light is here, that ought to well up in us prayer and, and private worship. Those in the darkness seek deliverance from man. Those in the light see its source in Christ and therefore turn to Him, which is done through prayer. There's also the delight in the coming light. We talked about this this morning. The fact that as Christians we ought to be joyful people. Uh, we see clearly uh, where once we were groping around in the dark, not knowing where we were supposed to go. Now we see. Now we see clearly because the light has come into the world and so there ought to be a joy that's part of our Christian experience. Then also we can see that there is a confidence in the unchanging nature of God. As God's people, there is the old and the new. They are the same, but in the new we have greater promises. That works in us an assurance. An assurance is increased because we are not left at the end of the day saying, which God am I serving now? He has been the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. So we have an assurance in the God whom we serve who gave the same commandment. The commandment has been from the beginning and it goes all the way through time. What has changed in the commandment? His instructions? No. The joy that we have in our obedience to the instructions because the light has come into the world. So Old Testament and New Testament, when we speak of them, it's not old versus new in the sense of replacement. The commandment is the same, though its motivations are richer and deeper in the New Testament administration. Now we want to look finally at uh, the things that are held in common. Uh, some is old, some is new. What do we hold in common? 
and we have seen already and spoken about it together, that it's not the standards for right and wrong that have changed. Uh, uh, it, those things have remained the same. And what John says in, in verses 9 and 10, uh, he speaks of those who make a profession of being in the light, but then in the end they prove by their actions that they're not in the light at all. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. So what, specific, what specifically is he addressing in our lives that would show us whether we are walking in the light or whether we are walking in darkness? He uses how we interact with our fellow man, our love or our hatred for our brother or for our sister. Uh, when that is the case, when we hate our brother, we are walking in darkness. When we love our brother, we are walking in the light. That's what John sets before us. Now, how do we know what it means to love our brothers? That becomes a question then. If we want to walk in the light, how do we know what that looks like? What is the shape that is given to us? And that's already been defined for us. Look at chapter 2 and verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Or in verse 6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. You remember that concept that was laid out by John at the beginning of his gospel, the fellowship that is true of the believer. Fellowship meaning mutual interest, uh, mutual interest in the things of God. If we have fellowship with John, we have fellowship with God. If we have fellowship with God, we have fellowship with John. If we have fellowship with our fellow man, we have fellowship with God. And how do we know what God wants us to do in relation to our fellow man? Well, he has given us a fairly straightforward and, and clear list of how we are to live in relation to our fellow man. It's called the Ten Commandments. Uh, there are two sections to the Ten Commandments. You probably know this. The first four dealing with how we are to relate to God. And the second, uh, the, the second half, the fifth through the tenth commandment, dealing with how we are to relate with our fellow man. Those are called the two tables of the law. And, and so if we are to understand how we are to live in love, to our brother, what we simply do is look at the second table of the law, those commandments that guide us in our relationship with our fellow man. And so what we do then is use the law to conform ourselves in the sense of the third use of the law. Now, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the three uses of the law, there are three ways that the law can be used. We use one every Sunday morning when we do our confession of sin. We use the law to point out to us our shortcomings, the fact that we need a Savior. That's one way that the law can be used. Another way that the law can be used is to restrain sin in every setting, even in the, the life of the unbeliever. The, the law can be used to restrain sin. But this is the third use of the law. Uh, the third use of the law is not as, as we might think that we can justify ourselves in the presence of God. That's not what the law is used for. The third use of the law is simply that we would respond to the salvation that God has purchased for us by being sanctified by His Holy Spirit according to His pattern. It is a guide for us as we are sanctified, as we are made holy by the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And so the law is used for that also. It's speaking of the third use of the law here, our guide for our sanctification. Now, we could spend weeks, months, even a year talking about all the different applications of the law in our lives and how we are to love our brothers. But what I want to do tonight in the remaining time that we have is simply give us a quick overview of what God speaks to us about in the second table of the law, commandments 5 through 10, that guide us in our relationship with our fellow man. Now the fifth commandment is what? Honor your father and your mother, right? The fifth commandment. Now, the fifth commandment isn't only speaking to us of our relationship with our parents. When, we, when it says to us that we are to love our brother, the fifth commandment helps us. It governs our relationships in terms of uh, rankings. Whether the person is someone who is in authority over you, whether it's somebody who is your peer, whether it's somebody who is inferior to you, the fifth commandment governs us in those actions. How do we relate to our fellow man in these different relationships? So, the fifth commandment, dealing with our rankings. The sixth commandment, what's the sixth commandment? You shall not murder. 
right? You shall not murder, the sixth commandment. It doesn't speak to us simply of the physical act of murder. It's, it's not looking at all of us like a Cain who goes out and slays his brother in the field. But it's speaking to us of the overall care of our own bodies and, and of the, the welfare of the people around us in terms of physical health. So if we are to love our brother, we are to consider the sixth commandment and have, it un have ourselves be conformed and understand how we are to take care of our own bodies, how we are to take care of the bodies of the people around us. In the Old Testament, uh, those kinds of laws would be included in our consideration of, of how we are to care for our livestock. Those laws that you read in, in the Old Testament where it says if your bull gets out of your gate and he gores somebody, you take him back to the pen and if he gores you again, the person who owns the bull is going to be put to death. Why? Because it's dealing with the sixth commandment. It's dealing with how we serve our, our obedience to the sixth commandment. Then we have the seventh commandment, which is do not commit adultery. Again, this commandment is dealing with more than just physical marital infidelity, but it speaks of the preservation of our chastity. It speaks with the, of the preservation not only of our own chastity, but also of the chastity of of the people who live around us. It speaks of our purity. It speaks of how we are to live, especially in our own age, in an age where sexuality is so often uh, flaunted, it's, it corrects us. It brings us into conformity, saying to, to our fellow man, this is how you love him. This is how you love her. You love him and her in purity. That is what you do uh, according to the seventh commandment. Then we have the eighth commandment. What's the eighth commandment, kids? Do we know? You shall not steal. You shall not steal. So is uh, God in this commandment simply wondering whether or not we're going to go to the grocery store and take a pack of gum without, without paying for it? It goes beyond that, of course. It, it deals with things like cheating, with not promoting uh, our own or our neighbor's well-being, with wastefulness. All these things are, are concepts that are guided by the Eighth Commandment. So if we are to love our fellow man, not only are we to uh, live respectfully uh, among them, not only are we to care for them physically, and not only are we to live with them in purity, but we are also uh, to protect their physical well-being in the terms of, of property, in terms of what they own, in terms of, of what they possess. And then we have the ninth commandment, uh, you shall not bear false witness. And so this deals more than just uh, law courts and and truthfulness and witness bearing, although that certainly is included, but it deals with, with truth telling in general, uh, lying and half truths and deception and manipulation. All of these things are contained in this category. So, uh, beyond what we are to do in terms of love for our fellow man in the previous four commandments, you also see that we are to live truthfully in the presence of our fellow man. And then the tenth commandment says that we should not covet, speaks of wanting what belongs to another. At its root is uh, contentment, of course, and we are asking ourselves, are we grateful with what God has provided us when we interact with the Ten Commandments? All those things are considered uh, when it says that we are to love our brother. The opposite, of course, if ne we neglect these commandments, is to live in hatred to our brothers. If we neglect these things in our relationships, we are uh, hating our brothers. And uh, so we consider those things when we speak when it speaks of the love that we must have for our brother. And then in verse 11, uh, John wraps up this section saying, uh, But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. We've touched on this earlier. But when we sin, when we do wrong, what we have in our lives is uh, a reminder that the darkness is not gone. The light is shining to be sure. But in our moments of sin, uh, we, prefer, uh, we prefer the darkness, we prefer the blindness, we are prone to fall into the, the pits of sin. So when Christ speaks of the, of the Pharisees, when that passage that we read earlier on, that they obey him on the, on the outside, but their inside is, is corrupted, he's speaking of an external compliance which comes with the wrong motivation. So there are things which are old, a commandment which has been from the beginning. There are things which are new, uh, the love and greater realization of the promises of God manifested in the work and sacrifice of Christ. Uh, 
all of these come together in love for our fellow man in, in this particular section. Defined for us in the Ten Commandments, in the second table of the law. The deepened motivation, this greater love, that forms the strong foundation for the Christian life. Uh, we love God, and this love for God is expressed in our obedience to Him. Like Israel in the Ten Commandments, so we also obey Him according to His will. But our heart motivation is brighter. Why? Because the true light is shining, and so our hope is bright. Let's pray together.